Panasonic GH4 has been our main video camera for about a year now, and it's an amazing video camera. It replaced the 5D Mark III, and it's just more usable, cheaper, lighter, even better video quality out of it, especially with that 4K. It's been just fantastic, but it's always had a hidden potential that we just couldn't access. Internally, it records to what's called 420. That's just a description of the video quality that I can record to, and that means that for the black and white luminance channel in the video, it's recording four bytes of data, four bits of data, for every one bit of color that's in there. So it's a bit like you had a really sharp black and white drawing and then colored over it roughly with a big fat crayon. <laughs> and for the most part, our eyes don't notice it. In fact, nobody's ever complained about the color in our videos. But if you hook up an external HDMI recorder to the GH4, it can output 4 to 2. And that means that you get half as many bits of color as the luminance channel. So in other words, you get twice as much color data recording to an external recorder. The GH4 has been out for a year now though, and we haven't been able to do that. But finally, two companies have put out 4K recorders. One of those is the Atomos Shogun, which we're recording with right now. Justin back there has kind of a cool setup with two separate cameras, one recording internally and one recording 422 externally. And this is not my normal umbrella, but it seemed like a good opportunity to test out the image quality, see if it was worth it, see if we could see any difference, because these recorders cost two grand. And you can get a seven inch display, if that's all you want, for like a hundred bucks. So is that two grand worth it? Will you see it on YouTube or in your broadcast uh, quality videos? So let's pause this and take a closer look. These are stills taken from the video with the ProRes 422 10-bit color on the left and the standard GH4 SD card recording on the right. The ProRes file clearly has richer color, so you could probably bump the saturation up to match it with the standard GH4 file. We uploaded the 4K video to YouTube and then re-downloaded it. After Premiere rendered it and YouTube transcoded and streamed it, the quality differences were gone. Therefore, if you're publishing to YouTube, you probably won't realize a quality difference. You might see a difference with higher quality services like Netflix or Amazon, but maybe not. For the record, we also swapped the memory card and Shogun between the cameras to verify that the cameras were identically configured. We also took video of smooth color transitions in blue skies, a classic scenario where greater color depth helps, and then we heavily graded it. We still didn't see any difference by the time YouTube processed it. Now we're recording with the Shogun's 422HQ setting, which takes up about 100 gigabytes of space per hour. The 422 setting uses about 75 gigabytes, and that does bring us to one of the costs. Besides the gear, you're gonna be using up a lot more storage space. The GH4 recording internally, in our experience, uses up about like 40 gigs for an hour of footage. It might be more if you have a lot of action into it. So let's zoom in and see if your extra storage is actually worth it. We didn't see any visible difference with the limited motion in the scene, but with an action scene, you'll definitely see fewer compression artifacts with higher bitrate ProRes HQ. The storage doesn't have to be that big of a problem. We found that the ProRes is really easy to edit. Premiere Pro seems to have an easy time scrubbing through it, so it doesn't really slow the computer down too much. And if it is a problem, we use an offline recording technique where we transcode the 4K video down to a lightweight 1080p or even lower video for the entirety of the editing. And then as the last step, we'll swap it back out with the 4K video. This is especially useful because one of our producers, Siobhan, is working remote and we have to transfer everything over the internet and these big files would take a long time to transfer. The Shogun can also act as an audio recorder. Now, you can run real mics into your GH4 and you can even run two mics in by using a left-right splitter. We do this all the time and we've always been happy with it. But the Shogun acts like a real audio recorder taking in XLR cables. We hooked up our Sennheiser GH3 mics, both of them, right into it to see how it will perform compared to the on-camera mic. And now let's see if we can actually hear any difference. Another thing we've noticed is that the battery on the Shogun is kind of appalling. <laughs> like we're used to the bad batteries on the GH4, which are constantly requiring recharging and carrying an extra battery. But this Shogun, man, it seems to only last like 
10, 15 minutes. So you're gonna have to get a bigger battery. Fortunately, we do have an extra big battery and it takes interchangeable kind of cheap Sony batteries. So you can just buy a bunch of these cheap batteries and keep them around. You can get bigger batteries, but then of course your, your gear weighs more. So you might end up just getting a bunch of the smaller batteries. So first, Justin, talk to me a little bit about the uh, audio and video connections that you can run stuff into the Shogun. Um, it does have SDI connections, which of course we didn't really use. It wouldn't make any sense to do that with the GH4, but... Yeah, SDI are these big barrel connectors that you tend to use in studio environments. So when we run our live show and we're switching videos, we have SDI connections. For right, that. You right. tend to use it on the go, though. Um, so it's nice that it has that. Yeah, it is a nice option, but we uh, primarily use this HDMI in. It's just a, I guess you would say a regular HDMI port, and it has a regular HDMI out as well, if you needed that for some reason. Yeah, so you could pass and, through to another recorder, right. or another monitor, which can be useful. Yeah, yep, and then it just has these uh, XLR uh, four, or I'm sorry, two in, two out, which uh, just kind of go into this dongle thing, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it does have kind of a, a clumsy connector on the side there, but... It, yeah. But that, that means you works. don't need a separate audio recorder. You don't need like an H4n or an H2n or something. It, right. Yeah, you can use this as an audio recorder with nice clean audio, no one eighth inch actual XLR connections. Yeah. So yeah, basically you use a micro HDMI to HDMI cable to get it into uh, from your GH4 into the Shogun, and then it records video and shows it on this nice big 7.1 inch screen. Yeah. And that yeah. might be one of the reasons you want to go with the Shogun too. So. You spent a lot of time recording just using the little flip-out screen on the GH4, and now you spent some time with the big screen. How does that change the experience of recording? Well, um, for one, this just looks incredible. It's so much easier to tell if things are actually in focus or just really how to gauge the color and, and things like that. And yeah, It's something that I think we'll be using all the time when we record videos now. Yeah, one of the challenges I know I had when I was recording 4K is you can think something's in focus and then you get it back to the PC and it's not in focus. And the GH4 has tools to help you with that, focus peaking, right. which is a liar. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times focus peaking says stuff is in focus and is not in focus. Yeah. And then your only real option is magnification. And so you magnify it one to one on this tiny little screen and get things in focus. But then it's video. People move, mm -hmm. things can fall out of focus and you can't necessarily tell. Um, so this allows you to see it with 1,200 lines of resolution. Yep. Not quite full 4K, but sharper than the human eye can perceive. Yeah. Like, like the retina displays that you have on your phone. It looks fantastic. So your odds of noticing that something went out of focus are much better. Yeah. Um, I also find that when I use it, I use it in tandem. Uh, I use this screen magnified 1 to 1 or 2 to 1. And then I look at the GH4's little screen for composition. Yeah. So I use that for framing and then zoom in and just use that for focus. So big screen is awesome to have, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the Shogun has basically the best screen out there. I could not find an audio record or a video recorder or field monitor that had nearly as good of a display. Yeah. Um, I should mention, I didn't mention the price. The, the Shogun is two grand and then you have to buy a drive for it too. It takes SSD drives. So I got a 480 gig drive for uh, 180 bucks. Mm -hmm. Not too bad. No. And that records what like over an hour of video for what we're recording right now yeah maybe yeah. like an hour and a half of video yeah so now let's go over kind of the physical features and the usability of the shogun with justin here so justin why don't we go over some of the cool features about the shogun it'll show you all this data about your filming and it helps you get the exposure right and the focus right uh show them how waveforms work okay so this is all just uh, touch sensitive display. It's really nice. It seems really responsive and snappy. And um, this would be your first waveform. It just basically shows uh, how much light you're gathering, whether you're gathering too much light or not enough. Uh, you could change the size of these displays, uh, which is another nice option. Yeah. Uh, so you can see it kind of works left to right, different from a histogram. But as it moves up to the top here, it's showing the that part of the frame is super bright. And over on the edges here, we can see it's not nearly as bright. So this actually shows us that we have some pretty heavy fall off in our studio. Yeah. Over by you, that corner is darker than it is right behind me. We might want to light it up a little bit more. <laughs> That's kind of the useful information you can get from a waveform. Absolutely. And this is what they call the uh, RGB parade, which is similar to the last waveform 
but it just kind of breaks it up into red, green, blue. Make it easy to tell if uh, you know if something's a little too red or uh, warm. Yeah, if the reds are high and the greens are low, you know, you might have the white balance wrong. Yeah. Also, good information that the GH4 just doesn't show you. Yeah. Easily. Yep. That's that. That's a good point. That's not really in the uh, GH4. This, I believe, is just a vector scope, which just tells you uh, more information about your color. Yeah, and like if your color is perfectly balanced, the highlight will be right in the middle there. Right. Uh, you can see over, probably Justin's, oh, well, you can see it's a very warm scene here. We might have too, mon too many oranges as a result of, we see the vector kind of leaning in. Yeah. But you might adjust the white balance on the camera until that we're right in the middle. Right. Yep. All very cool options. The GH4 actually has focus peaking. Focus peaking highlights high contrast parts of the picture to let you know which parts of the picture are sort of in focus. It doesn't <laughs> tell you exactly where the focus focal plane is, just which parts are up, up to a certain level of sharpness. So focus peaking will definitely highlight areas that are a little bit out of focus, which can be a problem. Focus peaking is really useful for video though. So the GH4 has that, as does the Shogun, but the Shoguns are a little more sophisticated if you want to show them off. This is the focus peaking. That's without focus peaking, so it's fairly obvious when it's on. Um, it does have several modes of focus peaking. This is a monochromatic focus peaking, which I guess just really makes it easy to see anything that's colored from yeah. the focus peaking so itself. So as I move in there, you can see like different parts of me are in focus, or I might move completely out of focus if I go <laughs> far enough back. Yeah. Oh yeah, you couldn't really see it, but... So yeah, you can see the red highlights disappear from me as I get out of the focal plane, and then... You can see my face comes back into focus here as I get closer. Yeah, and all the details in your sweatshirt, and this just kind of does the inverse of what the uh, monochrome image would do. Just a different form of focus peaking, really. Yeah, this hides everything. This hides the video and yeah. just shows you the focus peaking. So anything out of focus simply disappears. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or anything without contrast, really, because the whole screen here is in focus, but the white areas don't have any contrast in yeah. solid white. So you see this, the areas of contrast highlighted. Yeah, it could, it could be useful. And um, of course you can sort of change the uh, color of the focus peaking. And um, some of these I found a little more helpful than others, like yellow and green, they really jump out. But yeah, they're all really pretty cool. Yeah, I also like the user interface a lot better on the G than the GH4 because you could adjust the focus peaking with just a couple of taps. Yeah. But the GH4 is it's kind of diving nice. into the menus. Right, and just right. Just a little bit slower. And when you're filming, like, a lot of people are waiting on you. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of have to be able to pull these things up quickly and analyze it, especially if you're on a, a film set. And yeah. You have very expensive actors all waiting on you to get it just right. Uh, show them how false color works. I found that really cool. False color is very cool. So... Um, it just kind of color codes everything based on how bright something is or how dark something is. It might, I, I would say it would probably take me a little bit of getting used to this to actually be able to benefit from it, but it's still just a, a nice option to have. Yeah, you do kind of get used to it. So you can see the kind of spectrum here on the left side of the display just gives you a key. So up high, we have reds and oranges, and that means those are the brightest parts of the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have this light bulb over here that's bright red and some bulbs behind you that are bright red. Those are actually overexposed. But we can tell from false color immediately because that's the only red part of the frame that no other part of the picture is overexposed. We can see that the screen here, there's some variation in the brightness of it, yeah. which we wouldn't have noticed otherwise, but it's not quite overexposed, so that's probably okay. The fact that our skins are gray, kind of in the middle there, is good. That means our skin's not gonna be under or overexposed. And then parts of the frame that are going to be underexposed jump out really easily too. So like the dark grays down here and the purples. And these are stuff we don't care about. Yeah. So that's probably okay. But if your <laughs> subject were in there, you would know right away. So once you get accustomed to false color, yeah, it is a really useful way to, to spot what's going on. Yeah. Uh, another really nice thing are the graded previews. And this is more useful if you're using an A7S, but the graded previews will take your like Cinemark D or yeah, Cinemark D that is very low contrast, allowing you to gr grab a greater dynamic range and grade it. Mm -hmm. So when you record with Cinemark D, that's good, but the GH4 just shows you this really flat version of the video. Yeah. And as you're filming, you're like, everything looks super low contrast. You have no idea what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. With this, you can grade the video so it pops out and you see the full contrast of it, but it will still record the wider dynamic range. Yeah. 
because you can use this as an audio recorder, it has a couple of settings. This isn't so much a feature as it is a fix, mm -hmm. because as the GH4 is outputting video, there's going to be a bit of a delay to it. Uh, it could be a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second. But a tenth of a second is three frames, and two tenths of a second is six frames. And we found that there's about two tenths of a second delay. Yeah. So if you're recording audio with this, you have to configure the audio delayer to about six frames. It's nice, mm -hmm. because otherwise you get the video on your computer, and then you have to offset the audio yeah. to make sure the lips are synced, and that can be a problem. The fact that it does it by default, or can be configured easily, is nice. It is. It's helpful. You use this as an audio recorder. We normally record right into the GH4. How does it sound when you use those big XLRs? I, I thought I preferred this quite a bit, actually. Um, not just for the ease of use, you could just go directly out of a wireless mic pack that we use all the time, but we don't have to use these adapters that uh, adapt into an eighth inch. It'll go into the side of the camera, uh, which, you know, never sounded terrible or anything, but it does wind up sounding better, I think, just because it's XLR, and it's kind of designed for it. It's really nice. Yeah, those bigger cables, they have advantages. They just are better shielded, and they're less prone to any sort of degradation or interference. Yeah. It's weird, so many things are digital in this, but <laughs> the sound from our microphones to our camera is still an analog link, and that is subject to interference. And yeah, yeah. That just makes it better. So this guy weighs about a pound. Right. Which means if you're hand-holding, that's an extra pound. And if you're holding <laughs> yeah. it out, that can get heavy. And actually, that pound is without the weight of what you kind of need a huge battery on these things because the battery life has been appalling. The battery <laughs> and just talking about these here. You yeah, know, that adds just those cables weigh yeah. a bunch. So how has the weight been for you? Oh, it, it, it's, you know, as long as you have something like a rig, like, like we use, it's not bad, I don't think. It is noticeable, and it's particularly if you're using it for hours on end, but it, you know, I don't think makes or breaks it or anything like that. It, it has been a difference because you yeah. used to often just hand hold it the camera carefully right and that meant we could go to the aquarium and yeah. you could just keep it on your shoulder if you're going to be using this then suddenly you do need a rig yeah or a tripod yep so yeah, or a tripod yeah it's something to think about there's a, a downside to that exercise yeah it's it's something to think about we did mention this but how's the battery life been treating you it, it depends i mean this we kind of have this larger battery on here as you can see now uh that seems to work okay you, you might get I don't know, maybe an hour, something like that, out of this. That other smaller battery, we're constantly having to recharge and swap out this bigger battery. But in general, it's it's not great for either one of them, really. Yeah, the Shogun comes with this little battery, which yeah. is next to useless. Yeah. <laughs> How long does it record for, like, 20 minutes? Maybe, like, 20 minutes, maybe and, a half hour. And usually when you're recording, you spend, like, 15 minutes just, like, getting ready, yeah. checking the exposure. So you have it on before then. <laughs> so then you get like 10 minutes of recording time before it dies. That's right. kind of been our experience. So you have to get a big battery. But I bought this like for 20 bucks or something. Oh, they, that's not They're bad. not proprietary batteries like Canon or Nikon. They're just big old Sony kind of interchangeable batteries. So mm -hmm. they're, they're big and cheap and you can just get a, a bunch of them. Yeah. But at the same time, when you talk about using or not using this, it's one more thing to break. Yeah, Like the battery is. could just flake out. And, and by the way, the cable could flake out or the cable could come loose. So you are also adding all this extra complexity right. that wasn't there with just the GH4 on its own. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so there are all these things that make it a huge advantage. And it, if we're recording something here, just in the house or around, would you grab the Atomos or just shoot the GH4 standalone? Yeah, if for around here in the house... Um, even if we were like to go to Harkness Park or something, I, I would love to use this. I think it's great. It can be really helpful for the focus peaking. Um, if we we're going to be out and about all day and going to like New London or something, I might just grab the camera with the card. You know? Yeah. It, so, it, yeah, you wouldn't want to use it all day. For that, what that's we my do. take too. It gives you lots of information that can really help you make a great recording and help prevent you from screwing it up. <laughs> but at the same time, it can be kind of a pain. And as a recorder for what we do, for the type of YouTube publishing that we do, we didn't see a big difference in the image quality, the video quality coming out of it. Yeah. So I wanted to present another option, which is far under the $2,200 price tag here, but just a regular field monitor. Uh, there, 
there aren't a whole lot with sophisticated waveforms and such, but I did find the Lilliput 663, which supports waveforms and RGB histograms and nice audio levels, and it's not as, as sharp, but it has 800 lines of resolution, and it's $360. <laughs> so it's like 80% cheaper, about the same size, and will give you most of the capabilities that we talked about here, but without the ability to record. You'd still have to record internally to your GH4. It's also smaller and lighter. Oh, and by the way, it has a clip-on plastic screen built in. <laughs> How has this been without a screen looking at it in the sun? This is, is just terrible in daylight yeah. as far as it's, you can't see anything at all. No, it just completely disappears. Yeah. So you end up putting this big coat around it. Right. And, but it's not <laughs> meant, it doesn't, you can kind of clue it, screw it into the top there, but it doesn't have, you would think it, they had a case that clipped onto it. Yeah. A sun shield, like this one does. Right, Like right. most field monitors do, but they don't. Not that I could find. Yeah. So it gets to be kind of clumsy and adds even more weight and complexity to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I guess what I'm saying, for the GH4, you might just consider getting a field monitor if you like the idea of the vector scopes and the waveforms and all that. Save yourself some cash and some weight and some complexity. We have reviews coming up for using this with the A7S though. And that's a whole different world. Yeah. Because you can't record 4K internally <laughs> with the A7S. So it opens up 4K recording, which is what we're using right here. Yeah, yep. Uh, so be sure that you subscribe to see that full frame goodness and tell your friends about this video. And we hope that we helped you decide whether or not to get the Shogun for your GH4. Thanks so much. Thanks. <laughs>